2.2 1. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board this flight to Hong Kong. Please place all carry-on luggage in the overhead compartments or underneath the seat in front of you. We ask that you please fasten your seatbelts and, for safety reasons, we advise you to keep them fastened throughout the flight. 2. We also ask that you make sure your seat backs and tray tables are in their full upright and locked positions for takeoff. Please turn off all personal electronic devices, including laptops and cell phones. We remind you that smoking is prohibited for the duration of the flight. 3. Ladies and gentlemen, we ask for your attention for the following safety instructions. Please read the safety information card located in the seat pocket in front of you. There are six emergency exits on this aircraft, all marked with exit signs. Take a minute to locate the exit closest to you. Note that the nearest exit may be behind you. 4. The safety information card is in the seat pocket in front of you. Please read it. It shows you the equipment carried on this aircraft for your safety. Your life jacket is located under your seat. In the unlikely event of a water landing, place the life jacket over your head, fasten the straps at the front, and pull them tight. Do not inflate the jacket inside the aircraft. As you leave the aircraft, pull down on the red tabs to inflate the vest. If necessary, the life jacket can be inflated by blowing through these tubes. 2.7 with me in the studio today, I have Richard, who's a pilot, and Bryn, who's an air traffic controller. And they are going to answer some of the most frequently asked questions about flying and air travel. Hello to both of you. Hello. Hello. Okay. We're going to start with you, Richard. The first question is, what weather conditions are the most dangerous when flying a plane? Probably the most dangerous weather conditions are when the wind changes direction very suddenly. Hmm. Uh, this tends to happen during thunderstorms and hurricanes, and it's especially dangerous during takeoff and landing. But it's pretty unusual. I've been flying for 37 years now, and I've only experienced this three or four times. What about turbulence? Is that dangerous? It can be very bumpy and very uncomfortable, but it isn't dangerous. Even strong turbulence won't damage the plane. Pilots always try to avoid turbulence, but it can sometimes occur without any warning, which is why we always advise passengers to wear their seatbelt all the time during the flight. Uh-huh. Which is more dangerous, takeoff or landing? Both takeoff and landing can be dangerous. They're the most dangerous moments of a flight. Pilots talk about the critical eight minutes the three minutes after takeoff, and the five minutes before landing. Mm -hmm. Most accidents happen in this period, but I would say that takeoff is probably slightly more dangerous than landing. There is a critical moment just before takeoff when the plane is accelerating, but it hasn't yet reached the speed to be able to fly. If the pilot has a problem with the plane at this point, he or she has very little time, maybe only a second, to abort the takeoff. Are some airports more dangerous than others? Yes, some are, particularly airports with high mountains around them and airports in countries with older or more basic navigation equipment. Uh huh. For some difficult airports, like, let's say, Kathmandu, they only allow very experienced pilots to land there. And for some of these airports, pilots have to practice on a simulator first before they are given permission to land a plane there. Thanks, Richard. Over to you, Bryn. What personal qualities do you think you need to be an air traffic controller? Um, I think confidence is number one. Hmm. You need to be a self-confident person. You have to be sure of yourself and of the decisions you're making. Most people imagine that being an air traffic controller is very stressful. Do you agree? Actually, on a daily basis, the job isn't as stressful as people think. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it's true that stressful situations do arise, but when you're very busy, you just don't have time to get stressed. Why is it important for pilots and controllers to have good, clear English? 
English is the official language of air traffic control. We communicate with pilots using very specific phrases like、uh, runway, wind, cleared for takeoff, turbulence, traffic ahead, to your left, to your right, things like that. And it's true that you could just learn these specific phrases, but then in an emergency, you don't know what language you might need. It's much less predictable, which is why it's vital for pilots and air traffic controllers to speak really good, clear English. If I could just interrupt here, in fact, there have been several air crashes that happened because the air traffic controller misunderstood something that the pilot had said in English, or vice versa, because their pronunciation wasn't clear enough. Yes, that's right. Finally. People tend to think that most pilots and air traffic controllers are men. Would you say that was true? Not in air traffic control.、Hmm. There are lots of women. It may not be fifty-fifty, but there are plenty of us.、Mm-hmm. It's true about pilots, though. I mean, there are some women pilots, but it's still pretty much a male-dominated job, I'd say. Why do you think that is? People say it's because men have a better sense of direction. <laughs>、oh, very funny. Richard, Bryn, thank you very much. Two point ten. Boot. Oo. Flew. Through. Fish. E. Hid. Saw. Ah. Caught. Fought. Thought. Bird, er, heard, hurt. Phone, o, drove, rode, told, wrote. Up, a,、uh, cut. Egg, e,、eh, fell. Held, kept, left, read, said, slept. Train, a, became, lay. Two point eleven. We were on a flight to Lyon, and we'd been flying for about five hours. I was reading, and my wife was watching a movie. When suddenly we heard a very loud noise, it sounded as if an engine had exploded. The pilot didn't tell us what had happened until half an hour later. Two point fourteen. One. Two. Oh, what happened to the music? Three. Can I see your boarding pass? Oh no, I lost it. Where is it? Where is it? I'm afraid you can't fly if you don't have your boarding pass. Oh, here it is! Thank goodness, it was in my pocket. Four. Tom, this is Andrea, but of course you two know each other, don't you? Actually, we've only met once, so not really. Hi, Andrea. Hello. Five. I can't see a thing. I think we'd better stop for a little bit. Six. Excuse me. Please, could you tell me how to get to the train station? Sure, dude. Right down Main Street, left at the light, straight through the underpass, and then it's right in front of you. Pardon? Two point seventeen. Actually. Almost. Apparently. Basically. 
Definitely. Even. Eventually. Fortunately. Gradually. Ideally. Incredibly. Luckily. Obviously. Unfortunately. 2.18. 1. There was a lot of traffic, and unfortunately we arrived extremely late. 2. We definitely want to go abroad this summer, ideally somewhere hot. 3. It's incredibly easy. Even a child could do it. 4. Mark gradually began to realize that Lily didn't love him anymore. 5. I thought Roberto was Portuguese, but actually he's Brazilian. 6. Apparently Jack has been offered a promotion at work, but it will mean moving to New York. 7. I absolutely love Italian food, especially pasta. 2.19 The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry Part 1 $1.87 That was all, and 60 cents of it was in pennies. Pennies saved one and two at a time by bargaining with the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher until her cheeks burned with embarrassment. Three times Della counted it, one dollar and eighty-seven, and the next day would be Christmas. <laughs> there was clearly nothing to do but sit on the shabby little couch and cry, so Della did it. Della lived with her husband in a furnished apartment at eight dollars a week. At the front door, there was an empty mailbox and a doorbell that no longer worked, and under the broken doorbell, there was a card with the name Mr. James Dillingham Young. But whenever Mr. James Dillingham came home and reached his apartment, he was called Jim and greatly loved by Mrs. James Dillingham, already introduced to you as Della, which is all very good. Della stopped crying and fixed her makeup. She stood by the window and looked out at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she had only one dollar and eighty-seven cents to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months with this result. Twenty dollars a week doesn't go far. Expenses had been more than she calculated. They always are. Only one dollar and eighty-seven cents to buy a present for Jim. Her Jim. She had spent many happy hours planning something nice for him, something fine and rare, something Jim deserved. 2.20 Part 2 Della looked at herself in the mirror. She pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now there were two possessions that Jim and Della were very proud of. One was Jim's gold watch, that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. It reached below her knee and made itself almost like a garment for her. As she looked in the mirror, she had an idea. She did her hair up again nervously and quickly. She hesitated for a minute and stood still while a tear or two fell on the worn red carpet. But then she put on her old brown jacket she put on her old brown hat. With a brilliant sparkle in her eyes, she danced out the door and down the stairs to the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Madame Sophronie, hair goods of all kinds. Della ran up one flight of stairs and then stopped, panting. Will you buy my hair? asked Della. I buy hair said madame. Take your hat off, and let's take a look at it. Down came the brown hair. 
twenty dollars, said Madame, lifting the hair with her hand. Give it to me quick, said Della. The next two hours sped by quickly. She hurried through the stores looking for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores, and she had turned them all inside out. It was a platinum chain, simple and elegant in design. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. It was like him, quietness and value. The description applied to both Jim and the chain. She paid twenty-one dollars for the chain, and she hurried home with eighty-seven cents. Two point twenty-one, part three. When Della reached home, she got out her curling irons and went to work repairing the damage to her hair. Within forty minutes, her head was covered with curls that made her look wonderfully like a naughty schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror long, carefully, and critically. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself, before he takes a second look at me, he'll say I look like a chorus girl. But what could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and eighty-seven cents? At seven o'clock, the coffee was made, and the frying pan was on the back of the stove, hot and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Please, God, make him think I am still pretty. Della whispered. The door opened, and Jim stepped in. He stopped inside the door. His eyes were fixed on Della, and there was an expression in them that she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, nor any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her with a peculiar expression on his face. Jim, darling, she cried, "Don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold it because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow again." You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful, nice gift I've got for you. You've cut off your hair? Asked Jim, as if he could not understand the fact. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Don't you like me just as well, anyhow? I'm me without my hair, aren't I? Jim looked about the room curiously. You say your hair is gone? He said with an air almost of idiocy. Two point twenty-two, part four. Jim drew a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it upon the table. Don't make any mistake, Dell. He said, "About me, I don't think there's anything that could make me like my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why I was upset at first." Della tore at the string and paper, and then a scream of ecstatic joy. <gasps> oh! And then, alas, a quick change to hysterical tears and crying. For there lay the set of combs that Della had really wanted—beautiful combs, just the color to wear in her beautiful vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had longed for them without the least hope that she would ever own them. And now they were hers, but the hair that the beautiful combs should have adorned was gone. But she hugged them to her chest, and at length. She was able to look up with dim eyes and a smile and say, "My hair grows so fast, Jim." And then Della jumped up. Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him. "Isn't it dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it." Instead of obeying, 
Jim sat down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell, he said, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use right now. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. And now, suppose you put the chops on. 2.23 Interview with a Children's Book Expert Part 1 My name is Marion Pomerantz. I'm the manager of literary programs at a nonprofit in New York City called Learning Leaders. And I also have written three children's books. What was your favorite book when you were a child? My favorite book was If I Ran the Circus by Dr. Seuss. Um, it was the first book in my home that was for children. And it was just so exciting to have it, to hold it, to read it, and I still have it. What was it that you liked about Dr. Seuss? What I love about Dr. Seuss is his use of language, the words, the made-up words, the way the words flow together and sound. It just brought me to a different place, and I love that. Who read to you when you were a child, your mom or dad or both? My parents didn't speak English when I was growing up. They were, they were English learners as I was growing up, and I kind of helped them with language. And I think I introduced books to the home, really. Um, they became readers down the road. You have a son, right? Did you read to him? I have one son, and as a child, books were very important to me, and I think became important to him because of that. We read together every night. We read books like Stella Luna and Corduroy when he was young and, and continued to read together, mostly fiction. How has writing for children changed over time, maybe in the last 50 years? I think books have changed in that authors are more cognizant of writing about real children and real issues. I grew up with stories like Nancy Drew, who lived in this fictional America where everyone was Everyone was white and everyone had a mommy and a daddy and, and um, now they write about more honest and uh, true stories of, of what children's lives are really like. And that's a good thing? And that's a great thing. 2.24 Interview with a Children's Book Expert, Part 2 Do you have any thoughts about getting teenagers to read more? I do. I think teenagers would read if they were given more control over what they can read, if the choices were their own and they weren't told what they had to read, if they were told they were allowed to put a book down and start something else. Um, and you can read anything. You can read the ads on the subway. You can read a magazine article. You can read the side of a cereal box. I mean, that's all reading. Are there good authors or books in pop culture now whose material has encouraged teenagers to read? I think that the series books that are really popular these days that help teenagers want to read, like the Twilight series, the Harry Potter series, kids like to go back. They like to become familiar with a, with a character and the story, and, and I think those books have been successful because of that. Going back to kids, what is the key to getting a very young person to start reading? I think to get a child to start reading, the key is really to starting when they're young. Have books around your home, have a library card, um, share the books that you read with them, talk about the books at, at, at dinner, know what they're reading and talk about their books. Take a trip to a publishing house and, and see what goes into making a book. Meet an author if you can do that. Go to Go to a bookstore and have someone hear someone who's written a book talk about a book. I think you have to just get the excitement of books across. If you're excited about books, they'll get excited about books. What kind of books do you think young people enjoy reading? The kind of books that children like to read are books maybe with a little subversion in them, books where maybe the adults are a little goofy and the kids solve the problems. Children want to relate. They want to feel they have a little bit of power. I think young children feel that way. Middle schoolers feel that way. And I think if you look carefully at books that kids really like, it's the one where, where youth dominates and uh, kind of rules the world a little bit. 2.25. Interview with a children's book expert. Part 3. Do you prefer paper books or ebooks, and why? So I now prefer 
to read books on an e-reader on my Kindle. I, I have tons of books in my house and I haven't bought a book in three years. I only read on my Kindle and, and love it because it's, to me, it's more intimate than a book. I've chosen the type of print and so it's just me and the word. And, and the fact that I can carry a hundred books with me at all times is a thrill. Do you think e-readers are helpful for kids or teens who want to get into reading? I think it would be wonderful for every child to have an e-reader. We're, we're a technological society and we're used to pushing buttons and getting things instantly. And I think it might be really helpful for children to, to have their own e-readers and, and start their own collection of books that way. And you can see every book you've read and you can go back to it in two seconds, so why not? Do you think social media has decreased or increased people's literacy? So I, I think social media has had a positive effect on children. I think they're exposed to many, many more things. They can go online and get information on just about anything. I, I'm not afraid of the changes that any kind of social media brings to kids. They have to read, they have to write. Maybe they'll read a few less books, but maybe they'll write some amazing things about their adventures online. I, I think it's great. Do you think despite all the technology, books will survive? Yes, I think there's a great future for books. I think they'll be around for a long time. I think we all like to have our moments with a book, so sure. Do you still read for pleasure? And if so, how much? I read daily. I read on the subway. I read before I go to sleep. I read to relax. I'm usually reading three or four books at a time. Whatever pleases me, I go to. I'm always reading. 2.26. Interview with a children's book expert. Looking at language. 1. What was it that you liked about Dr. Seuss? What I love about Dr. Seuss is his use of language. Two. The words, the made-up words, the way the words flow together and sound. Three. You can read the side of a cereal box. I mean, that's all reading. Four. And I think if you look carefully at books that kids really like, it's the one where, where youth dominates and uh, kind of rules the world a little bit. Five. Do you think social media has decreased or increased people's literacy? So I, I think social media has had a positive effect on children. Two point twenty seven on the street. Jill. What was your favorite book when you were a child? Um, I think my favorite book when I was a child probably is Where the Wild Things Are. Why did you like it so much? I think I liked it because of the fantasy aspects and uh, it was just a creative book and I think a lot of kids like it for that reason. So. Did you see the movie? No, I did not see the movie, unfortunately. I should, so. Was there a character in a children's book that you identified with? Well, I used to read a, a book series called Trixie Belden and Trixie Belden was a sort of a teenage or young teen um, mystery person. And she was very curious and very, um, liked to solve mysteries. And I always fashioned that, you know, I would like to do that as well. <laughs> Sean. What was your favorite book when you were a child? Probably The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Why did you like it so much? Um, I remember we had a teacher at school who read it aloud to us in, um, when I was probably six or seven when I was too young to read it myself um, and I remember getting the book and then sitting down by myself and reading it and I think it was the first time I realized how much you could get out of a book I think. Was there a character in a children's book that you identified with? I can't think of any specific characters I think I was quite a scruffy child I always had dirty knees and torn clothes and things like that so whenever there was a a boy who got into lots of trouble. 
I usually thought that's a little bit like me, but I can't think of one particular one. Rachel. What was your favorite book when you were a child? I think that, I think Coraline by Neil Gaiman was my favorite. Why did you like it so much? I liked the writing style. A lot of, a lot of books just sort of have a wall of text that's hard to absorb, but I thought it, that was easier to read. Was there a character in a children's book that you identified with? I identified with Coraline because I tend to be curious about stuff and also because in a lot of the sorts of books that I like, unfortunately, the protagonists are usually male. 2.28 Colloquial English Phrases 1. Trixie Bilden was a sort of a teenage or young teen um, mystery person. 2. I remember we had a teacher at school who read it aloud to us. 3. I realised how much she could get out of a book, I think. 4. So whenever there was a, a boy who got into lots of trouble. 5. I identified with Coraline because I tend to be curious about stuff. Two point thirty four. One. Blow. Snow. Showers. Below. Two. Weather. Sweat. Heavy. Heat. Three. Drizzle. Blizzard. Chilly. Mild. Four. Hard. Warm. Dark. Garden. Five. Flood. Moon. Soon. Loose. Six. Fought. Ought. Drought. Brought. Seven. Thunder. Sunny. Summer. Humid. Eight. Scorching. World. Tornado. Storm. 2.35. One. It'll be below zero tomorrow with some snow showers. Two. He was sweating heavily because of the heat. Three. It's windy, chilly, and starting to drizzle. Four. The river is going to flood soon. Five. Summer days are usually sunny and humid. 2.36. 1. It was just at the end of the summer in 2013, yeah, and I was a college student at the University of Colorado in Boulder. It had been really dry that summer, hardly any rain at all, and it was incredibly hot. Then toward the end of September, the rain came, and it rained almost an entire week. At first, everyone was so relieved because the rain brought cooler temperatures and made the grass green, but then, it just kept raining and raining. Streams and creeks started flooding and roared out of the mountains, and it was really scary. The stream that goes through my college campus flooded several dorm buildings, and kids had to find safe places to stay. Some rooms had three to four feet of water in them. I was okay because I lived on a high floor in my dorm. Even though there was a lot of damage to the campus and to a lot of the town surrounding Boulder, there was a bright side. Kids on the athletic team served lunch to flood victims in the community. Other students donated their clothes, shoes, and books to kids who had lost their belongings in flooded dorm rooms. So, uh, even though the flooding was extremely severe, it really made me realize that we have a supportive college community here. 2. 
This was in the summer of 2003, and there was a pretty intense heat wave in New York City. I remember it really well because I just started working as an office assistant in a civil engineering firm, and I'd only been at my new job for a few weeks. Around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, on August 14th, the electricity went out all across New York City. The massive blackout, caused in part by everyone using their air conditioners, affected seven states in the eastern U.S. along with parts of Canada. My boss told me to go home, so I did. First, I had to walk down 17 flights of stairs because the elevators didn't work. Then, I had to walk nearly four miles from Manhattan to Brooklyn in the heat because the subways didn't work. Thank goodness I could walk over the Brooklyn Bridge to get back to Brooklyn. When I finally got home around 8 in the evening, I was absolutely surprised and happy to see all my apartment building neighbors outside cooking on grills and getting to know one another. It was too hot to stay inside, so I enjoyed the evening sitting outside on the sidewalk with my neighbors. It's been over 10 years since that blackout, and I have very fond memories of that day. But I don't really want to go through that experience again anytime soon. 3. On October 29, 2011, I was visiting friends in upstate New York when it started snowing. It's pretty unusual for snow to fall in New York during late October, but I was safe with my friends, so I didn't mind. The next day, it was time for me to drive home. It had only snowed about three inches in Albany, and the roads there were completely clear, so I thought my two-hour trip home would be uneventful. However, as I started driving south, I noticed the snow was getting deeper. Trees were bent over and many had fallen. Driving was rather stressful because the roads were slippery and dangerous. When I finally got home, almost five hours later, there was nearly two feet of snow on the ground, and I couldn't drive up my driveway, which only added to my stress. I parked on the street and trudged up to my house, only to discover there was no electricity. I ended up booking a room in a local hotel for a week until work crews reconnected the electrical wires. That storm caused billions of dollars of damage across the Northeast. Over three million people were without electricity, some for up to three weeks, and cities across the Northeast reported record snowfall totals. In addition, many communities had to cancel or postpone Halloween celebrations. It wasn't safe for the children to walk in the snow. Luckily for me, no trees had fallen on my house during the storm, but I was mad that it took me several days to shovel my driveway. 2.38 1. Yes, I think I am, or anyway more than I used to be. I think my attitude to risk has changed as I've gotten older. For example, I'm more open to risking a change in appearance because I think I'm less self-conscious now. I often change hairstyles and colour, but when I was younger, I had the same hairstyle for years and years. I also think I would take more risks travelling now because I'm more self-confident, so I'm pretty sure I could cope with any problems. 2. Yes. I'm definitely a risk taker. I take risks to do things that I enjoy like skiing or riding a bike in New York City, which is pretty dangerous. In fact, I think the element of risk probably makes them even more enjoyable. The only time I wouldn't take a risk would be if I couldn't see that I was going to get any pleasure from it. I wouldn't do something risky just for the sake of it. 3. I'm the kind of person who likes to know exactly what I'm doing and when I'm doing it, so there's not much room for risk in my life. For me, risk means not being completely in control, and that can make me feel really nervous. For example, if I'm meeting a friend for dinner, I always make sure we have a table booked somewhere nice. I wouldn't risk just turning up and hoping that there was a table. And I never buy clothes online, because I don't want to run the risk of them being the wrong size and having to send them back. 4. I'm definitely not a risk taker. I might like to think that I am because it seems exciting, but I'm not. 
I live in a suburb of Boston, and I'd never walk home on my own in the evening when it's dark because that just seems like an unnecessary risk to take. And I'd never get into a taxi on my own at night. But on the other hand, I would love to do something like bungee jumping or paragliding, which other people would probably think is risky. 5. I don't see myself as a risk taker. I've done a lot of mountain climbing, and everyone assumes, because of this, that I'm attracted to risk, but it isn't really true. In fact, when you're climbing high mountains, you're always trying to minimize the risk. The biggest risk I've ever taken in my life was a professional one. After 20 years in the same job, I left and set up my own company. And that's given me a lot more sleepless nights than climbing in the Andes or the Himalayas. 6. I am happy to take risks. I love driving fast. In fact, I bought myself a sports car when I had some money, and I got quite a few speeding tickets, though probably not as many as I deserved. I also take risks with money, like lending to people who probably won't pay me back or spending all I have on something a little bit unnecessary. Last year, I went on a balloon ride, and I was amazed that so many people said, Ooh, I wouldn't do that. I loved it, and I'd happily do it again. It was fantastic. 2.42 Dialogue 1 1. I'll tell you as soon as I know my plans. 2. If six of us go, it won't be too expensive. 3. We'll have to book soon if we want to get something nice. Dialogue 2 4 I'll be waiting by the ticket office when you get there. 5 What will you do if I'm late? 6 Well, give me my ticket in case I get there at the last minute. 2.43 If we rent a house in the mountains, will you come skiing with us? I'll tell you as soon as I know my plans. How much do you think it'll cost? If six of us go, it won't be too expensive. Well, I'll have to check my dates first. Okay, but we'll have to book soon if we want to get something nice. How will I find you at the theater? I'll be waiting by the ticket office when you get there. What will you do if I'm late? I don't finish work until 7 o'clock. I'll wait for you until 7.20, and then I'll go to my seat. Well, give me my ticket in case I get there at the last minute. 2.44 For most of us, the riskiest thing we ever do is to get into a car and drive. And because this is something that we do almost every day of our lives, we need to take the risks involved in driving very seriously. Sandra, you're an expert on road safety. How dangerous is driving compared to other ways of getting around? Mm. Driving gets a lot of bad publicity. Mm -hmm. Statistics show that mile for mile, it's riskier to be a pedestrian or a jogger than to drive a car or ride a motorcycle. But car accidents do happen. What's the main reason? Many fatal accidents occur because someone has broken the law. The most frequent cause of fatal accidents in the U.S. is distracted driving. Mm. When a driver focuses his attention on a cell phone or to eat something, and the second most frequent is driving too fast. And the third major cause of fatal accidents is drunk driving. Mm -hmm. Tell us about some of the other factors that can increase our chances of having an accident. Well, the time of day we're on the road is a very significant factor. Oh. Generally speaking, driving at night, for example, is four times as dangerous as during the day. This is mainly because visibility is so much worse when it's dark. By day, a driver's visibility is roughly 500 yards. But at night, driving with headlights, it can be as little as 120 yards. Are there any times of day or night that are particularly risky? 
Mm. Mm -hmm. Research shows that you're most likely to have an accident between 5 and 7 p.m. during the week. That's to say during the evening rush hour. And especially in the winter when it's dark. And the day of the week when you're most likely to have an accident is Saturday. Huh. In the U.S., more accidents happen on a Saturday than at any other day. Why do you think that is? It's probably because the weekend is when the highest number of people are driving. Mm. Therefore, the more people driving on the roads increases the chances of having an accident. Which brings us to where accidents happen. Mm. Just over 50% of accidents happen within five miles of where we live. Statistically, the most common kind of accident is crashing into a parked car near our home. Research shows that drivers concentrate less well when they're driving on familiar roads. Fortunately, most of these accidents are not fatal. So what about fatal accidents? Where do these tend to happen? As far as fatal accidents are concerned, the riskiest kind of road to drive on is a rural road. Hmm. More fatal car crashes in the U.S. happen on country roads than on city streets. In fact, 4,000 more car accidents happen on a country road than on an urban road. And why is that? Drivers often think that it's okay to break the speed limit on these roads because there's less traffic. And consequently, they take more risks. Mm -hmm. And the safest kind of road to drive on? A freeway is by far the safest kind of road. People, usually men, say that women have more accidents than men. Mm. Is that true? Well, it is true that mile for mile, women have more minor accidents than men. Huh. But a man is twice as likely to be killed in a car accident as a woman. So men really are more dangerous drivers then? Women, by nature, are usually much more careful and cautious drivers than men. In general, men take far more unnecessary risks when they're driving than women. Hmm. The age of a driver must be an important factor, too. Yes. In fact, it's probably the most important factor. A driver aged between 17 and 24 has double the risk of having an accident than an older driver. Hmm. The reasons for this are obvious. This is the age when drivers have very limited experience with driving, mm -hmm. but it's also when they're most likely to drive too fast and take unnecessary risks, particularly if there are other young people in the car. Uh, which is why a lot of people would like to see the age limit for having a driver's license raised to 21. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a very good idea. Well... That's all we have time for. Thank you very much for coming into the studio today, Sandra. And to all you drivers out there who are listening, drive safely. 2.45, a short movie on The Weatherman. New York is known for sometimes having extreme weather. So where do New Yorkers go for the most up-to-date weather forecasts? They watch their favorite TV weatherman, Mr. G. Hi, I'm Mr. G. I'm the meteorologist at Channel 11 here in New York, WPIX-TV, and also CBS Radio in New York. So I'm in charge of telling a story, building a drama of cold temperatures, wind chill factors, snow on the ground for 35 days. For the 19th time this season, flakes are in the air. It's been snow to sleet, it's been sleet to snow, it's been snow to sleet to rain. It's been raining on Long Island, sleeting in the city, snowing in the suburbs. I want to build up this story to announce what people don't want to hear, another possible snowstorm. The polar vortex is back. More on this later on. Does, does a cold winter mean a warm summer? No, it's folklore. So how do New Yorkers handle all this bad weather news? Certain kind of weather affects people. I mean, it's been a winter where snow's been on the ground a long time. That affects people. I think people have been indoors a lot. But New Yorkers are a tough group. I think people want to connect. Uh, and so weather's a great way to connect. Whether you're single and you want to meet somebody, talk about the weather. Whether you want to complain, talk about the weather. And even though the weather may not be getting any better, the technology we use to predict it is. When I first started the business, it was 72-hour forecast. As the science progressed, 
Now everybody sees a seven day forecast. Well, what you're gonna see in two years is a 10 day forecast. And when my daughter grows up, it will be a 30 day forecast. So what makes for a great TV weatherman? Connecting is a big part of the job. The people know the weather. They get it on the computer. They get it on the app. 32% of the audience between 10 and 11 o'clock in New York City watches the news, which means to me that they still want to get it from somebody they trust. So they watch Mr. G for a reason. I still haven't found out that reason, but I know I work hard to tell a good story every night.